Breeze in downtown Seattle, I'm Ursula Reutin. From Kirkland to Queen Anne, this is Cairo Radio 97.3 FM. News and talk, powered by the Pacific Northwest. The Dory Monson Show on Cairo Radio. This is The Big Lead. Who's watching over and supervising your children? Sometimes the answer to that question is really scary. Welcome to the big show. Coming to you from the Carter Subaru Studio and streaming on Facebook Live. We got an awful lot of news to talk about again today. It's just relentless. It's a fire hose of news every day. Let's get right into the big lead. The big lead. Top story. How do you get rid of a school board member who appears to be somewhat unstable? If these court documents that I have in my hand are to be believed, there's some really scary stuff going on over on the peninsula. Over in Jefferson County, the little town of Chimicum, the Chimicum School District has a school board member. His name is Robert Bunker. And his ex-wife, or his uh, still wife, but they're separated, she's gotten a restraining order against her husband, and we have obtained court documents of this restraining order and some really shocking stuff that include coercive sex, a sex contract, and uh, this guy is still on the school board. The board has asked him to step down. They, both the school board, his fellow school board members and the superintendent, want him to step down. He has not said if he will. He has a restraining order now that prevents him from going within 500 feet of the school where the school board meetings take place in the library. Let me tell you a little bit about Robert Bunker, his uh, separated, estranged wife alleges that he has stalked and harassed her, among many other allegations. This is a guy who was appointed, and by the way, a lot of details, the Peninsula Daily News newspaper, is the, they're the ones who broke this story. I want to give them credit. This guy was appointed to the Chimicum School Board in 2013 and then elected by the people in 2015. And now he can't go within 500 feet of the school where the school board meets. He has been asked, as I said, to resign immediately. In the separated, the estranged wives' allegations, she says that he hired a private investigator to follow her, something he admits. He told the newspaper, yes, I can tell you I hired a private detective to find out what my wife was doing. But some of the other allegations, here's what she wrote in in her own words in the request for the protection order. The harassment stalking threats will continue. He will keep texting me. If I block him, he will show up at my home, work, or car. He will threaten my friends and family. I don't know what he would do. I'm tired of being afraid every day. And then she attached a contract that he and her signed. And this is where it gets bizarre and even more disturbing. Uh, According to this protection order, she and he signed a contract that requires her to pay him $500 per month to remain on the house title and to, quote, perform sexually for him as often as is possible as requested or desired by both parties, as well as to, quote, perform wild sexual acts when he set them up at her acceptance. In exchange, he said he will not bleep up a third person's life. When he was asked about this contract by the newspaper, he wouldn't comment on it, but he did not deny it either. And as I said, in the court documents is that contract that appears to have been signed by both him and her. What does it take to get rid of a school board member? You know, they have to get his resignation. But they're now fearful for the safety of the kids. And there's a lot in these court documents. She says that he put a GPS on her car to know her whereabouts. 
uh, called and harassed her family to the point they won't take his calls, threatened to make copies of intimate videos and spread them around her work to humiliate her, calls her tramp, whore, narcissist, uh, sent her links on psychological problems and said they were me, wanted me to make contracts, giving up my equity, granting him spousal support and sexual favors, on and on it goes. And, and we're talking about a school board member. You know, these are the people who are in charge of overseeing your tax money, a huge amount of tax money that goes to the schools. And the school board, the superintendent, they want to do the right thing. But they have to ask him to resign, even after the protection order was granted against this guy. And so, hey, Robert Bunker, do the right thing, man. You can't be on school board when you have such serious, and look, I know that there are false allegations out there in bitter separations. Don't get me wrong. But I also know that when you have a signed contract about how somebody is going to perform sexually after you're separated and that you have to do wild things and all the other things that are in some of these documents here, that's not the sort of person that we sh- And I've also got a bunch of text messages that he has sent that are really disturbing. They're filled with expletives, so I'm not going to... I'm not going to read you those text messages. But uh, this is where we need a system to better protect tax dollars, kids, and people who are trying to escape a poisonous relationship. And the fact that this guy remains on the school board as of today, there was a court hearing that's going on right now, in fact, regarding uh, many of these things. I'm going to keep you posted on this. Because I know that nobody else, local media, has this story. The Peninsula Daily News uh, just broke it. And I wanted to make sure you were aware because it's another example of how difficult it is to get rid of public employees who are doing the wrong thing. Speaking of which, next up, in the big lead. The big lead. Your tax dollars at work. Chris Ingalls from King 5 Investigators. He came on with us last week. He had just a great story about this Olympia power couple. He is the chief education policy guy for Governor Jay Inslee. She is the clerk in the State House of Representatives. They earn $280,000 a year between the two of them. And yet somehow they qualified for a low-income condo in Bellevue. They own a waterfront house in Olympia. They signed a contract that required the Bellevue condo be their primary residence. But somehow, oh, and this woman, she also, Nona Snell Altman, she has been involved in writing affordable housing rules for the state of Washington. So she knows the system. And somehow this Olympia power couple... They bought a low income. These condos are designed to let poorer people, working class, low middle income, to get into the housing market for the first time. And that's why they have a requirement that this must be your primary residence. And when Chris Ingalls confronted her last week, known as Snell Altman. Hi, Ms. Altman. We're from the King Five Investigators. How is it that you and your husband? qualify for your condo at the McKee? Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm a little caught off guard by this. Okay. And I'm also on my way somewhere. And she was also tired. I just got back from a trip. I'm very tired. I'm, and I'm supposed to go meet my mother right now, so I need to go. Okay. Well, can I ask you, you own a house in Thurston County. Yes. How is the Bellevue condo, which is a second home, how would that qualify as an affordable housing unit? I, like I said, I don't, I need to uh, give this some thought. I'm not really sure. Well, because if you believe the reporting, and I do, Chris Ingalls is a great reporter, and he has seen the contract that these condo buyers must sign that says it will be their primary residence, and it was neighbors at this condo who have blown the whistle. Uh, not only this Olympia power couple, but as Chris reported last night, 
And Chris Ingalls is going to join us at 1.30 this afternoon. But as Chris reported last night, there are other people who have somehow bought these condos and then they rent them out. So the taxpayers have spent $50 million to this group. It's called ARCH, a regional coalition for housing. And you and I have invested $50 million to subsidize these affordable condos so low-income people can get into the housing market. But instead, you have Olympia power couples who are in the governor's office and sitting at the front of the state house who make $280,000 a year. Last night, Chris told the story of another woman who's one of those condo owners. Her name is Sandy Yin, and uh, neighbor Laura Duncan says, yeah, this woman has never lived in that condo. She bought it years and years and years ago. She has never resided in it. And she's a real estate agent. She knows better. Nah, I mean, if you can rip off the taxpayers, you're going to rip off the taxpayers, which is what this sounds like to me, until some of these owners come up with uh, something compelling that tells Chris and you and me that they have bought them legitimately. So Chris Ingalls went up to Sandy Yen. Ms. Yen, I'm Chris Ingalls from King 5 News. And she claimed that she lived there. Was that your primary residence there, or did you move out of it at some point? Uh, it's my primary, and then it's also my grandma's primary. Well, the neighbor, who's the whistleblower, uh, one of the many, because a lot of these other condo residents say, yeah, they're, they're breaking the rules, just left and right there. Uh, Laura Duncan said she's never seen this owner. I have not ever seen her grandmother. I don't think her grandmother has ever lived in that unit. And uh, Sandy Yin claims she didn't do anything wrong. Weren't you just renting the condo out or leasing it to people? Uh, so, 20, sorry, it's just like a bug on me. So basically have everything approved. I didn't do anything that's against any rules. Well, the Condo Association disagrees with that vehemently. You have to make it your primary residence. And they also provided Chris Ingalls with ads on uh, Craigslist and elsewhere that that apartment was being rented out, which is blatantly in violation of the rules. Um, you're going to have to talk to my lawyer if you need any more answers. Okay, so then he asked for the name of her lawyer and she wouldn't give him one. So she just can't answer Chris Ingalls' questions. And so what this gets back to is this group, ARCH, that oversees the affordable housing program. And this is something I've been telling you for years now, that government is primarily an insider scam to get our money. I mean, like with Sound Transit, it's a way to get, over time, $100 billion so that contractors and labor unions and real estate developers can make tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. It is not about transportation. It's a jobs program. This affordable housing, what kind of a scam is this? That the taxpayers invest $50 million in this group called ARCH, and then their enforcement is so lax that an Olympia power couple works for Jay Inslee and the house that they can get a low-income condo when they make $280,000 a year? That a real estate agent, who knows what her connections were or are? And, uh, and there were a couple people that Chris Ingalls busted in his story last night. So taxpayers good-heartedly say, oh, $50 million for low-income housing. Yes, tax me, tax me, tax me. But then we find out that these programs have such pathetic administration and that Olympia power couples can personally profit from it. It's just funneling tax money to the powerful and the connected. And the fact that more people haven't seen through this scam that is so much of government in our region and in our state that the party in power I mean, it's like, let me uh, let me go to the next story in the big lead because the big lead. 
I sense a Dory rant coming on. This also illustrates it. This carbon tax, this initiative, 1631, that'll take billions and billions of dollars from you and me. And you have all these dopey people who will save the planet. Tax us. It'll save the planet. No, it won't. It won't do one thing for the planet. It's a way to just have government control billions and billions of dollars. Don't believe me? Investors Business Daily, a national publication that, again, has no particular axe to grind with our state. But they have a headline story today. Five states could wreck their economies in futile fight against climate change. And Washington is one of those five states. And as they write, none of these will make any difference in the global climate, but they will cost their residents dearly. In Washington, voters will decide whether to be the first state to impose a carbon tax. It would start at $15 per ton of emissions. It would climb by $2 every year after that. This tax will hit everything, they write. From gasoline prices up by as much as 59 cents a gallon, to electricity bills, to everyday household goods. That translates into hundreds of dollars a year for a typical household right out of the gate, with costs climbing to nearly $1,000 a year by 2035. An analysis by the National Economic Research Associates also found that the state would cut, or the tax would cut the state's growth by 1.4% in the first two years. Even more absurd than the tax hit, however, is the fact that the initiative includes numerous exemptions, such as on aluminum protection and fuel bought by government and Boeing. Talk about pointless. The UN says the entire world would have to slap carbon taxes of up to $5,000 per ton to avoid a supposed climate change catastrophe. And by the way, if we followed that U.N. report, gasoline, I'm not kidding you, gasoline would cost $240 a gallon if we followed that U.N. report. Washington State's action will only hurt Washington residents. In other words, Washington's tax amounts to nothing more than very expensive virtue signaling. It's just a way that dopey people can feel good about themselves. They do nothing for the planet. They will have to pay a thousand bucks a year starting in a few years for this tax. And it'll do nothing for the planet. It is. Feel good virtue signaling. You got to vote no. If you haven't voted yet, you got to vote no on 1631. It is one of the most wasteful Tax money transfers from us to them that you will ever see. And that is your big lead for today. The Big Lead on Cairo Radio. And then the issue that I mentioned on the show yesterday that's getting almost no attention. But who's going to control the state house and the state senate? That's getting very, very little attention. But that's going to be critical to your economic future. Talk with the state senator about that. Coming up next, the Dory Monson Show gets rolling here on a Wednesday afternoon.